All right, good morning. This is Sunday School, Acts chapter 17, please. And we're going to pick up in verse number 31. We'll go 31 through 34 and hopefully finish this up. Uh, today I want to discuss a little bit about the judgment of the world versus the judgment of the body and how it is important to understand that you can escape the judgment of the world. Okay, It's a very... Um, it's very good news. If you're not if you're not familiar with the judgment of the world that is to come, uh, you definitely want to get out of that. If you have your Bibles, turn to Acts 17 and verse number 31, and we'll read this this passage and we'll get into this. Acts 17:31 it says, "Because he hath appointed a day, and in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and he hath raised him from the dead. And when they had heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked." And others said, We will hear thee again of this matter. So Paul departed from among them. Howbeit certain men clave unto them, unto him, and believed among the which was Dionysius, and an Arapagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. The issue there in verse number 31, where it says, and he hath, Whereof he hath given assurance unto all men. See, the assurance is something that is uh, the demonstration of, of power, which is the resurrection, right? The resurrection shows that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. Because there has been nobody on this earth that has been able to experience a resurrection and not die again, right? So you, know, you have a handful of people who were resurrected during the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ, right? And it's sad to think that those guys had to die twice, you know? I mean, think about Lazarus. Poor Lazarus, you know? But his resurrection, of course, was not for his flesh. It was for those that are around him that they might believe, right? That miraculous act was simply for them to, to believe the power of Jesus Christ and just a demonstration of the resurrection. Now, when they start talking about the resurrection, obviously people are going, what? No, what? That's why they're mocking him. They heard of the resurrection then they mocked it. Okay, we followed you up until that point, right? They, they just didn't want to believe that part. Well, the assurance of Jesus Christ being resurrected from the dead shows that he has power over death. And that, to me, is the greatest news of all, right? I mean, that's, that's what everybody goes, okay, well, what, where is the power of the resurrection? It's, it's the fact that he overcame death, okay? Nobody else has been able to do that, and death to most people is that unknown, right? It's the, it's the well, what happens next and what takes place, right? But there is something that is very true, that all men don't want to die, right? They have this desire to live. And they want to live, and you know you have that fight or flight type of thing that goes on, and people just you know your your body's response to anything that's going to kill you is to try to survive, right? And so the reason why why is that? Well, to most people, death is so unknown, and they're scared of it. See, the world knows that there is a judgment that takes place after death, and that the judgment of the world is different than the judgment of those in the body of Christ. I want to make that very clear. We are not judged, and we are not condemned with the world, right? The body of Christ does not experience the same judgment. Turn with me to the book of 2 Corinthians, chapter number 5, in verse number 10. Paul says in 2 Corinthians, chapter 5, in verse number 10, so while you may escape the judgment of God in, in the sense of the um, judgment for sin, that is the wrath of God, you cannot escape the judgment of Christ, okay? Which is a judgment that is mostly on the basis of service, but it also is the basis of ministry. And we're going to look at the one of the, a very important word in here that you may receive. Okay? Verse number five, chapter, second Corinthians chapter five, verse number ten, it says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. So when Paul writes here to those in Corinthians, he is talking to those who are believers. We're going to see those in Acts chapter 18. What does Paul do? He spends a lot of time in Corinth, right? How long does he spend in Corinth? Do you guys remember? In Acts chapter 18? It says he spends a year and a half. A year and a half. That's a long time for a missionary like Paul to spend there at Corinth. And you think, why is he spending that much time in Corinth? I mean, this is like the Gentile, you know, there's a lot of Gentiles here, but there's also a lot of Jews in they Corinth. They're very bad. They're very bad people. <laughs> but he spends a lot of time there because as you read in that passage, uh, uh, Christ says he's got much, much people there, which is pretty cool to see. We're going to discuss that with the foreknowledge of God. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 10, he says, for we must all appear, Okay. So that's a mandatory issue that, look, uh, on your agenda, if, you're having, if you have a calendar, go ahead and put on your calendar that it's going to take place. Okay? You're not going to be able to escape that. That is going to occur. And our belief about when this takes place, we believe this to take place at the point in time after the rapture, right? Pretty immediately right after the rapture. We rapture the church, then we believe that the judgment seat of Christ takes place. And it says here that we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that notice the word, that everyone may receive. And this is an important thing. See, there's, a re there's something that you get, right? You may receive the things, notice he says, the things done in his body. 
So after you're a believer and you, you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, many people fail at the next step of the Christian life. Uh, Frank did a sermon two weeks ago, three weeks ago on how to live the Christian life. Anytime we preach a sermon that says practical Christian living, how does one live the Christian life? How do you live as a Christian? Those sermons get three times as many views, right? As, as any other sermons. Why? Because the vast majority of people are struggling to still figure that out. How they should live after being saved. How they should live as a justified member of the body of Christ. But I don't feel saved. I don't, I don't feel justified. I don't think that way. What is it? Well, it comes with a teaching and a learning that we're going to look at in just a minute. But notice what he says. That he may receive the things done in his body. Now notice what he says. According to that he hath done. Do you have control over what you do? Yes. Do you have new control after you're a believer in Christ? Yeah, much better control. Much better control. And, 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 and what, what causes that control to take place? The Holy Spirit, right. Right? right? The indwelling of the Holy Spirit teaches you about that. When I talk to people and they go, you know, man, I'm, I, I'm, so, I'm struggling with a lot of sin. I'm like, well, you know what's good? It's good that you're thinking about that, Right? Because you know who's you know what's what's prompting that thought process? The Holy Spirit. If you're if you're if you are if you're knee deep in sin and you're not struggling with it or you're not thinking about it, well there's a problem there. What's what's the issue there? Have you have you really quenched the Holy Spirit that much? Have you grieved him that much, right? Have you just dismissed him to that extent? Right? No. What what, what takes place in, in the life of a believer is that the majority of them never get any instruction in the way that they should operate. And, and, and then they just pretty much live a life as if it, nothing really changes between the time they believe and the time they die, right? The vast majority of their life is the exact same. They live pretty much the exact same way. Nothing, nothing in their life changes because they're not focused on the next step. If, you're, if you understand that the next step is everyone may receive the things done in his body, they're going to go, okay, wow, what, 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 does, what does my body mean? What do I need to do with my body? What is, what is the steps? Well, God, and God says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, Go with, that, go with me to that passage. Let me look at that. 2 Timothy chapter number 2. Second Timothy chapter number 2 and verse number 19. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having the seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his. Of course that he does. And he says, And let every one that nameth the name of Christ do what? Depart from iniquity. What does it mean to depart? Stop, let go, <laughs> right? But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. Is it not obviously going to take place that there's going to be a, a lot of individuals at, at the judgment seat of Christ who, who will not have much? Most of it will be wood, hay, and stubble? Yeah. Sure. A, a lot of people will just have, that's all they got. They got wood, hay, and stubble. That's it. Now, why does that matter? Why should somebody care? To, to, the, to the optimist, they just go, well, who cares? I got in, right? I'm in. Doesn't matter. I'm in. Who cares, right? Well, is that how you, you please him? Is that, is that really what you want to do? Well, there's some verses in Colossians we'll look at in just a minute, but keep reading here in, in, first, in 2 Timothy chapter 2. He says, but in, the, but in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore, notice this word, purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. See, what has to take place is you have to be taught this. I mean, do you understand that? You, you, don't, you don't just like get saved and all of a sudden you get all this knowledge about how you should live your Christian life. Paul talks about it in Ephesians 3 and Ephesians 4, and, and actually to turn there, and uh, we're going to come back to 2 Timothy in a second, but turn Ephesians chapter to Ephesians chapter 4 with me, okay? This is how you would learn how to walk in the Spirit, okay? Ephesians 4, verse number 17, he says, This I say therefore and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk, and what does that word say? In the vanity of their mind. It really starts with how you think. It's so simple. And you go, how, how, how is it that easy? It really is. I promise you, the Christian life is not that difficult. 
It's not some crazy formula people have been struggling for years to find. It's there in the scripture. It's given to us by Paul. And right here in the vanity of our mind, that is to say having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all in clean, cleanness with greediness. Verse 20. But ye have not so learned Christ. Right? Come on, folks. This is like, you know, it's like going to school. Some people get it and others don't. And those that usually don't get it, you know why they don't get it? Because they're lazy. <laughs> you know? That's why they don't get it. Most people are not really, you know, sure, there's some pretty smart people. When you go into the room and you sit down and you break down this doctrine here, what does Paul say? That, 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 you're, that Satan would beguile your minds from the simplicity that's in Christ, right? It's simplistic. It's very easy. Read what he says. But ye have not so learned in Christ, if so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that ye what? Put off. Again, choices, right? Purge yourself. Put off. Concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your, what's the next word? Spirit of your mind. Okay? And that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor. For we are members one of another. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more. But rather let him labor. Working with his hands a thing which is good. That he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. But that which is good for the use of edifying. That it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. Whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Look, so when people go, well, why do I care? If I'm going to get to heaven anyways, what's the matter? Well, there's a tendency to look at heaven as the end game. It's the destination. And once I trust Christ, I'm saved and I'm finished. They don't look at it as the future and I'm going to have activity and participation going forward. It should be the start. See, salvation is the start. It's not the end. It's, salvation to most is just, oh, I got to heaven. Good, great. Well, that's, that's an end goal benefit, sure. But, but really, now what is it? Why? why what, what benefit does it do you now when you're living on the earth? Why should you care about walking in the spirit, right? We have grace, right? Can't people just say that? No people say that? Obedience, number one. Obedience for what reason? They're going to go, well, I got to heaven anyways. Who cares? That we may please him. Right. See, look, if you're not going to fulfill the will of God in your life, and you're going to grieve the Holy Spirit, then you know what you're really not doing? You're not redeeming any of the time. Right. You're just wasting time. If God gave you that chance, and he says, look, redeem the time, for the days are what? For the days are evil. You need to be ready for the Master's use. Go back to that verse in 2 Timothy, chapter number 2. And we'll jump back to Ephesians. The Master's use, they're thinking earthly ministry. Well, it's, it, it, it translates. You're being ready for the master's that, use. I don't think people think that way. Right, right. It, it, you start with the master's use on earth. If you can't do it on earth, how, how are you going to do it in heaven? But you right? won't have a chance. Right. You go, well, you're not, ready, you're not even ready to do it. You know, you didn't prepare yeah. now. And the preparation is not like this burdensome thing, right? That people right. are like, oh, but to live like a Christian is so burdensome. It's so hard. You know, it's so really? Easy. What, what do you mean? What do you mean it's so burning and so hard? The, the issue is, yes, yea, they, all those who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. That is very true. So when you start to discuss righteousness, expect people to not want to respond to righteousness. When you start to say, yeah, no, I don't believe that people should. We just we were talking about this as we were driving down the you know, 60. You guys go drive down 60 through the middle of the state. You know how many abortion billboards you see? It's crazy against abortion. They're all like, God loves every life. You know, lives are pre precious. You know, the heartbeat starts at 18 days. All those little things. I mean, I probably saw 30 of them going down 60. So I assume that they probably have a big problem with that in that, in that area and in that region. Or but somebody's doing something about it. 
Well, yeah, at least it's good. And I always, I like some of the things is they had pictures of a couple. I will adopt your baby. You know, I thought that's kind of cool stuff. That's, that's interesting to see. So, but, but to the, to the, to the vast majority of people, they're not, they're not, you know, liking, you know, they don't really appreciate life at all. And, and to the, to the believer, the appreciation for life, when you start to stand up for that type of life, you're going to get some, trust me, you're going to get some rebuke. You start to tell people that yeah, you should, that, look, you shouldn't abort. You know what's going to happen? You're going to get all kinds of crazy things. And they're going to tell you, well, you know what they automatically always do in that situation? It's very simple. It's one, one, one thing they always say. They always go, rape and incest, right? That's what they always say. That's, well, that's the, the argument. The for the majority of abortions. What's what I say? I said, oh, so the majority of abortions are done, done because of rape and incest? Wow, show, show me the, the show, show me thing. And I always say this. It's the easiest. easiest. What's well, so the discussion point is this? When do, when does when do two wrongs ever make a right? When should we ever allow you know the murder for the good? Right? That doesn't that doesn't, that doesn't help. It doesn't, it doesn't there's not there's no benefit in that. It's really to take away the the uh, the responsibility, which is what mankind has been trying to do forever to shift the blame. If you can shift the blame, you're going to shift the blame. You see Adam do it. What does Adam do right in the beginning? Well, she did it. She made me do it. Right? So that's 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 your nature. Your nature wants to do that. He wants to blame shift. Whenever man is, is held accountable to God, there's going to be no opportunity for you to blame shift. Going back to 2 Timothy chapter 2, in verse number 21, he says, If a man therefore purge himself from these, he, it, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Verse 22, flee also youthful lusts. But follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. You know what people say to me? That's not a fun life, though. I've had people say, well, it's more, it's more fun to sin. How would they know? true. How much have you pursued that? Right? What, what, re, what reward or what Paul says, what fruit did you have in those things wherever you're now ashamed? What benefit was that for you? What did it do for you? Right? It's really every time you sin... It's believing the lie of the devil. You know that? Yeah, because it's not a faith. Sure, but it's also just, it, the, the devil's lie is to say, this sin is more important. You need, this, this, this is more important. This is good. You need to do this. Don't listen to what God says about how sin can hurt. Don't listen to what God says how sin is bad. Don't listen to how sin can create problems in your life. No, 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 no. That's not true. Just, just, go, just go do those things. And, the, and again, it's that in the moment now, not looking at the further, you know, the, the future aspects of what could take place, right? I mean, think about the people who have who have gone. Well, look, I'll just I'll just take like twenty bucks, and then I'll, I'll I'm working at this job, and you know, I'll just I'll take take another twenty dollars, and I'll, I'll I'll embezzle a couple more dollars, right? And they're thinking it's just for a little bit, and then it turns into this huge long disaster, or or the guy who's like, well, maybe I'll just go to the strip club once, and then I'll check it out twice, and then maybe I'll call a call girl, and then maybe I'll. You know, and then they ruin their whole life. You know, it's like, well, that was that was dumb. And we can say that. We can go, that was dumb. Why? But you know what? The susceptibility of all men is the same, which is that what? What does Paul say? There's no temptation taking you by such as is common to man. So we all experience the same exact issues. Don't think for a second, like, well, no, pastors never have those issues. And 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 only the No, look, it's all the same thing. Level level out the playing field and understand that the major reason why sin is the problem. Is because you still have your flesh, but that doesn't really help you. It, it, the, the motivation for me is that the reason why you should stop sin in your life and, and, and allow the Holy Spirit to work in you is because it affects and impacts your ministry. Absolutely. If, 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 it, if, if my ministry was impacted, and I'll tell you the story, the guy that was um, uh, my buddy's cousin, he's grown up Catholic, and he goes, he says, well, you know, I don't know, you guys... I mean, why would I want to be a Christian? You, it's, like, it's not like you guys live any differently than me. <laughs> you know? I mean, he's got a fair point. Yeah. He goes, so what? Just because you believe one little thing differently than me, and I'm going to hell and you're going to heaven, but you live the exact same, you know, life as me? That doesn't make any sense. And so as you can see, that prevented the belief. The, the lifestyle of another individual can prevent belief. The people look at you and go, well, you're not living like that. So, so what's the situation? Right? It does impact your ministry, and we should care about that. That's why Paul says here, flee also youthful lust, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But foolish, unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strifes. And the servant of the Lord must, be, must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, 
and also patient. So why should you care about walking in the Spirit? Well, look, don't you want to fulfill God's will in your life? If God says, this is my will, and you go, ah, no, I'm not interested. <laughs> okay, well, that doesn't seem very uh, thankful for what he's done for you. Further, do you not care about grieving the Holy Spirit? Right? So people look at like the, the issue of grace as the license to sin. You should more look at it as grace is there because of how sinful you are. That's the, that's the, that's the only way it could occur. It's the necessity of our sinfulness. And really, should we, re, should we be redeeming the time? Absolutely. I think so. Look, as I said, you've got to be taught. You've got to be taught and understand that there is a battle that's constantly going on. The battle in Ephesians chapter 6 says in verse number 11 that you should put on the whole armor of God. They may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So we should be aware. We should be familiar with those wiles. But ultimately, why do we care about those wiles? Because they impact how y your ministry could work. Go with me to back to Ephesians. And uh, go to chapter, where do we finish in Ephesians? We ch finished in, uh, go to chapter 5. Look what he says here. Be therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know that no whoremonger nor unclean person nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words. For because of these things, now notice this word, cometh the wrath of God upon the who? Upon the children of disobedience. Are we children of disobedience in this room today? No. Why? Because we believe the gospel. The wrath of God comes upon the children of disobedience. What does Paul say here? Be not ye therefore partakers with them. Don't go and hang around with the children of disobedience and, and do all those things. He says, now, you should, you do need to go out and, and hang out with those individuals to, g to give them the gospel, right. remember? He says, not all together with the fornicators of this world, because you need to go out and give them the gospel. If any man that is a brother, remember that, remember that passage in Corinthians, right? Yeah. So be ye not therefore partakers with them. Notice this, for ye were sometimes darkness. But now are ye light in the Lord. What is the next word? Walk as children of light. Come on, don't, don't you get this? It's like he's telling you, like, he's, he's telling the Ephesians, walk as him. Don't you get it? Walk like this. Have this as a part of your life. Not, I love the word compartmentalize. That's what the majority of people do with their Christianity. It's compartmentalized into Sunday, and that's it. Sunday's Christian day, Monday's world day, Tuesday's world day. Wednesday might be Christian day if we go to Sunday school or Bible study or something. Thursday is World Day, Friday's World Day, definitely World Day, always World Day. Saturday is Super World Day, Sunday morning is Christian Day, and that's it. They compartmentalize their Christianity as, a, as, a, as not a, a, a really a part of their walking life, but just this is what I do on these days, and other than that, it's completely gone. There's no difference. You could never tell, that you never even understand that person's a Christian, never talk about it, never discuss it, they never act like it. And you would go, how, how do we even know you're a believer? That's why they don't lose their Bible. Well, yeah, of course. It's always right where they left it. So they, they pick it up the same day. It goes back in the same place, in the same spot. They pick it back up the next week, and they're back, they're back to it. And you go, well, well you're, that's mean. You shouldn't be talking to people like that. Well, we should. That's, that's the purpose. <laughs> the purpose of the body is to have care one for another. And, and you know, we need to help people because if we're going to evangelize more and more, which is the purpose, right? So what's the major purpose? of the body of Christ is the evangelism, right? What is the, what is the, what is a bigger purpose of the body of Christ than to save the souls of mankind? None, right? Save men, get them to the knowledge of truth, have them go out and do the same thing also. So in verse number uh, nine, he says, for the fruit of the spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable in the Lord and have no, notice this word, fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather, and here's that word, reprove them. See, if you start doing that, people are, you're going to lose friends. It's going to happen. People are not going to be very happy about it. Now, what, what do you do? Do you go up to the person that's sinning and go, stop sinning? No, because you know what? That doesn't matter. They, they, they can't. And they don't have any power to do so. So it's really interesting to talk to people and, and find out the reason why they never did believe the gospel or they never wanted to is they go, well, I can't stop sinning. Well, yeah, no, neither can I. 
You know, when you kind of rationalize with them and say, look, it's be realistic here, that, I, that that's, not, that's not how you're getting justified, and that you're being justified freely by his grace, the redemption that's in Christ Jesus, I think they'll be more apt to listen. And it does take time. You know, how, 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 how do you sin less? I remember Russ very early on in, in, in the discussion with him saying, you know, you, you do sin less and sin less and sin less. You do not become sinless. I thought that was actually a pretty good point. But also that you, the stands of maturity is that you look back and you go, okay, have, have, what has my improvement been in certain areas, right? Has my improvement been better in this part? And it's not that you're just improving your behavior to be a little bit better, but it's a, it's a sign of maturity, right? Purging. Right? You're like, okay, that stuff doesn't, no, nah, that stuff doesn't really interest me as much as I used to. This right. stuff, not as much as I was before. This stuff over here, no, nah, I'm good. That stuff, I, I, I've learned, right? I've learned. I've matured. Now, going on in verse number 12, he says, For it is a shame to even speak of those things which are done of them in secret, but all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then, notice this, that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. How do you think the majority of Christians walk? Not Ooh. circumspectly. <laughs> right? And isn't that sad? It is. It's sad to think that the majority of individuals, and you go, well, you just over here at Sun Coast Bible Fellowship, you just got the corner on the truth, don't you? You guys got the edge on the market. Yeah, all, all you know, 30 of us. We're just crushing it over here, you know? No. It, 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 in, in all, honestly, you think God's got the truth? We should probably just read it. Probably. I, I went back to saying how much time have people really spent trying to learn this? I think the answer is not much, right? When people tell me that the Bible is difficult, I said, really? So is calculus. <laughs> I was at a funeral and, and, and brought up the idea of it as well. I said, they'll go to college. You don't know who wrote the book. You don't know what his belief system is. They'll tell you you have to pass it. You will go for hour upon hour upon hour to study something. You don't even know if it's true. You're just doing it to get point. I said, why don't you dedicate the same interest in this book Prove it right or wrong. Study it as you would study something that didn't even matter. It's, it's like he says in Acts, what does he say in Acts 17? That he is not far, right? He says, remember Acts 17, verse number 27, yep. that they should seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. He's they right should. there. They should seek I mean, they should seek after they him. That they should seek <laughs> after him. And how much time have they really spent seeking after? I mean, I can attest to you that I spent hundreds of hours of my life seeking after it, trying to find it after I you know, was introduced to um, dispensational Bible thought and just really contextual Bible thought. I never really thought, oh, contextual? Why would we think about the context? It's all, <laughs> it's all the Bible. It's all for me. And so it, took, it, took, it did take hundreds of hours of my life of sitting there and getting into it and going like, well, that's cool. I, I've never heard that before. Never read well, that one. That's what happens when you start to read and you believe the verses. You all of a sudden go, wow, I never saw that. Let's look further. Sure. You get, you get stimulated in your interest grows because that inner man's being filled and being edified. Sure, sure. And, and, we, and we want to, as, as Paul say here, to, to not be as fools but as wise. I mean, everybody wants to be considered intelligent, you know? Nobody goes, man, I can't wait to be the fool, all right? No, they all want to be smart. They want to know what's going on. And you, you and, and in, in, in the pride of man coming to a Bible study, as, as Russ gave the last couple sermons, you know, save, satisfied, and sitting is not what you want to be doing. You know, it, it is it is time for an action, and edification is not just for who? It's not just for you, right? Edification, cool, let's just build you up. It's to, to build up others also. So when he says here that you walk circumspectly, that means you're aware of the surroundings. You understand what's going on. You have a knowledge about what's taking place. Not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. I remember my mom used to always be like, you're just sitting there wasting your time playing video games. <laughs> I'm like, come on, I got a bed job at some point. <laughs> my brain hurts, you know? It's not, it's not redeeming the time. Anyways, in verse 17, I like this. He says it kindly, wherefore, be ye not unwise. Come on. Be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. As I said, you have to be taught and learn how to walk in the Spirit because it is ultimately a battle. And I want to read with you in Ephesians chapter 3. So many of these verses are good. But read in verse number 3 and verse number 18. This is what Paul's desire is for the believer, that ye may be able, 3.18, he says, that ye may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ, which what? Which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. 
Now to him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. So why should you care? Well, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 5 says this. 2 Timothy 2, verse 5, he says, that unless a man strive lawfully, he is not crowned, right? He says, and if a man also strive for masteries, yet he is not crowned, except he strive lawfully. What's a prime example of that? Remember the guy who rode his bike? Lance Armstrong? Oh, yeah. You know? One more Tour de France than anybody else, and then find out he's, you know, shooting up and, you know, becoming, taking performance-enhancing drugs and all kinds of things. Well, we're stripping you of everything, yeah. right? He didn't strive lawfully. We stripped it all away. And what is the lawful issue here? So in the mastery of the Christian life, what would you consider to be somebody who is a master of the Christian life? What does it mean to be a master of the Christian life? How would you define it? How would you define one that's a master of the Christian life? Well, we do have Paul as the pattern. That's okay. The only one that is the pattern. And, and, and what would you, give me, give me, give me a, so if, he, if Paul's the pattern, give me like the top, the top things. What, what is it, what is like the quintessential picture of that? How, how does that one live his life? Well, he brings his body into subjection. Right. Right? And what, what would you say would be the hallmark of the life? Love? Charity? Yeah, grace? Thankfulness? Right? All the rest of the fruits of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, right? All those things. That's how, if you think about those words, right? I, I do it all the time. I go, it's really weird, but I'm going to tell you I do it all the time. I'll walk around and go, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, right? And I go, how, how, is, how, how is that working? Right? How is it in my life? How is the love? How is the joy? And I was talking to my buddy, and he goes, um, do you got a short fuse? I said, <laughs> and I kind of did that, and he goes, what's that mean? I said, you already just blew it up. You know? And I go, I got a real short fuse. And he goes, well, why? And I said, no, I've been working on it. I said, actually, you, this guy's an unbeliever, too. I said, you have a really short fuse, or you have a really long fuse, and I'm, I'm, I actually admire your long fuse. He goes, I just don't let things bother me. I said, yeah, I noticed that. And my wife has a really long fuse, too. So I've actually, if you notice, I don't, if you probably have known me in the last five or six years, my fuse has actually gotten much longer. <laughs> I, my, my, I mean, it's not, it's not long. You know, it might be three inches as opposed to one inch, but it's getting longer, you know, which is good. My, I, I'm, I'm demonstrating some temperance, right? I'm, I'm, I'm having that. I have some long suffering now. I, I've, I've let it go. And it's not, it's not I, I can look back and I can honestly see that that's the case. I can say that I am happier, right, that I do have joy. I trying to demonstrate joy love, right? Joy is great, and that's what you really want. Yeah. But you want that you want that true true joy, which comes from hope, right? right? So having love, having joy, having peace. I have great peace. I tell people all the time, oh, I have great peace. People are like, really? Yeah, lots. I'm like, oh, it's because you make a lot of money. No, that's I could care less about that. That's that's not my peace. I I explain to people. Most many of my friends know my situation with health, right? And how I was I considered myself to be basically on my deathbed. I didn't know if I was gonna live, I had no idea. Take it out, I don't take do exploratory surgery, rip out stuff. I don't know, whatever's wrong with me, I don't I just want to get it fixed. But I did know that my eternal destiny was was sealed. And with that, I, I think we can if we can if we do demonstrate those fruits of the spirit, people will notice that. They'll see that. I have a couple friends of mine who are really good at that. My buddy Aaron is like you meet him, and he's he's just got he's just a meek kind of guy. Todd's another guy like that, really kind of meek, mild dude, right? And I'm like, you know, you demonstrate very good fruits of the spirit in that regard. He can he doesn't fly off the handle, and he he, he does get you know the indignation against the unrighteousness stuff, and he gets frustrated at things, but he demonstrates good meekness. He demonstrates that good long suffering, the gentleness, right? And I'm always like, oh, okay. So demonstrating it because of Christ in you, hope of glory. Correct. Yes. Well, you know what I mean when I say that. Some people, are, some people are introverted. Too. I'm not meaning that you're, you're, you're actually know, working to, to do the flesh. Yes. Because people will tell you that if I were to be a Christian, well, I can't do this anymore. I can't do that anymore. Uh, I have to quit smoking. I, I can't drink anymore. And, you know, I had a friend who had, I, I thought he had a great little story for that. He would say to them, well, well time out. Wait a minute. Do you get cleaned up to get in the bath? Sure. Sure. <laughs> you sure. Know you, don't. you don't have to give up anything. What you need to do is come to an understanding of the knowledge of the truth. If you'll trust him and you'll allow him the word of God to work in you, then it'll take its course because he'll have an effect on you. 
Sure, and if you and if you get if you read the scripture and you get a conviction about a certain thing, it's probably a good thing. You know what I mean? Like that's probably good. Let the, let the conviction work My through cousin, it. Let it work is through you. Me how he's doing so much better, and it's really not that he, well, he is, but I don't think he's consciously avoiding. What's sure. happened is he's filling up because he's in the Bible every day. Sure. And his sure. life is being transformed, and he's looking back and saying, "I'm not doing that anymore. I'm not doing that anymore." And is it because I'm too busy? Is it because my interests have changed? Or is it because Christ in you? Right. Is yes. Transforming. Yes. And, what, and what I mean, I mean, I'm not. I don't. I want to be very clear that I think sometimes we we do a uh, responsibility shift, and the responsibility shift okay. is to say, "I don't have to. I don't have to do anything." Right. You That's know, it's it. like, "Whoa, That's hold on, it. you have a responsibility." In your flesh, your, 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 your responsibility to your flesh is that you are you're bought with price, right. and uh, that price was really expensive, more more more, more than any type of money you could possibly have, Romans and that 12, one and two. exactly. But then you should live, as he says here. If any man also strive for mastery, he said he's not crowned except he strive lawfully. And in the lawful aspect of how you strive is what what is the this is how I look at the judgment seat of Christ in my mind. What is the motivation for the things that you're doing? Right. Turn with me to First Corinthians chapter number nine. The motivation, in my opinion, is selflessness. You're not thinking about, well, let me get lots of rewards. Those are great. That's a good thing. It's, I, I'm just going to use the little rhyme, the attitude of gratitude, right? It's the attitude of gratitude. My attitude now is to, is to please. My attitude is to be, to be grateful for this. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, I like how he says it best. He says it right there in the beginning. Verse 19. For though I be free from all men... Yet have I made myself servant unto all. Right there. That is selflessness. You make yourself a servant unto all? Why? Why, why, do, you make this, why do you want to do that? That I might gain the more. Isn't that weird? Because most people, when you're going to gain, what do you do? You're looking out for number one. You're looking out for yourself. So Paul says here, look, look, no, no, no. I've made myself the servant of all that I might gain the more. And he goes through the ways he did that, right? All of these verses. To the Jew, I became a Jew that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law is under the law that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law is without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ. I do want to preach on that because so many people ask me about that verse and they go, what the heck is he talking about? And it's actually easy, but I, I won't have time today. He says, that I might gain them that are without law. Verse 22, to the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means do what? Save, and there's that word, some. So when you read in Acts chapter 17, when Paul does all the stuff he does there in Acts 17, how many get saved? Few. Few. Howbeit, certain men cleaved unto him. Howbeit, even after all that stuff, certain men cleave unto him. Just a few people. It wasn't like, wow, Paul, you did such a good job. Look at how many people, how many professions of faith you received. Look at all the souls that were saved. Again, I've said Paul's life in ministry, the successfulness, was not determined based upon the number of converts. And that is a very dangerous path to go down, to start going, how many converts did you get? How many? Because how, you're working this numbers game that's just not in your power to control. Your real ministry is to strive lawfully. And as he says here in verse number 24, uh, verse 23, and this I do for the gospel's sake. Notice that. Yeah. He's not doing it that I might get lots of rewards. The first priority is this I do for the gospel's sake. Second priority, he says, that I might be partaker thereof with you. He's like, there's a, ben there's a joint benefit here. And the joint benefit is, know ye not they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize, so run that ye may obtain. That ye may obtain, may obtain what? Well, the same thing he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. That ye may receive the things done. That ye may receive. Don't you want to receive? Well, look what he says. And every man that striveth for the mastery is, is what is that word? Temperate in all things. It's the same thing he just said in 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 5. Right? You're not going to be crowned unless you do what? You strive lawfully. And what is the major issue of striving lawfully? Self-control. You notice that? Self-control is a big issue there because he gives you the choice. See, the part of it is when you go to the point where you start saying, Christ's doing it, Christ's doing it. He is. Definitely is. But the responsibility is up to you to execute the free will that you have by faith, by believing right. the words. Yeah. That's what it comes down to. Do you believe it? I do. 
So now, so now do it. So when you tell God, oh, I believe all these things about it, he's like, well, that's, that's cool. I'm glad you're saying you're doing it. Let's, let's put that stuff into action. you got the conscious choice to do that. When you have, see, the, the way that Paul, when Paul says grieve not the Holy Spirit of promise, see, people think like grieve, grieve just means like you sadden, right? That's pretty bad. I look at it as just, it's more conviction. You know, con, you know, the grieving of the Holy Spirit is the conviction of your conscience. That's all it is. The more you grieve the Holy Spirit, the more your conscience is convicted, right? Convict, 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 grieve, grieve, grieve. And then what does Paul say? If you do it too much, he says quench. And what does it do to quench? Quench means I'm not listening to you anymore. I'm done. You can grieve me and quench me all day long. And what does Paul say to that one? Oh, well, hopefully that guy's flesh is destroyed so he doesn't ruin the gospel message anymore, but that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus, right? I don't know if that guy's a believer or not. I have no idea, right? I can't tell. People I'm sure you've met over the years have done some really crazy things who have claimed to be believers. And you go, well, hopefully he is. I have no idea. I mean, I, I, he's given me a profession of faith. He said he is. Hopefully Satan just took him captive at his will, and he's doing that. But hopefully he can recover himself out of that snare. So Paul says again, And every man that strives for masteries is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we in incorruptible. See, when people start going, well, how do you know you're going to get a crown? How do you know you're going to rule with Jesus Christ? And, you know, it's not like the Bible just lays out, like, step one, believe the gospel. All the rest of this stuff, not really super important until you get the gospel. You got the gospel down? Great. Step two, they almost want it like Cliff Notes books, you know? Or they want the condensed outline. When I used to go, when I was in law school, my outlines, and I'll brag for a second, were the best outlines. I don't care who you were, my outlines were the best. People wanted my outlines so bad because they were, t I never, I didn't mess around in school. I listened, I paid attention, and I, I could write 150 words a minute, so I got everything. I never missed a beat, and I got everything that guy ever talked about. And, and I would highlight everything, I'd, I'd bold it, underline it, notate it, italicize certain things. I would make it perfect. And I had this page, and what I would do is I would take, not exaggerating, I'd probably take 150 pages of notes in a class. And then I'd take that 150 pages of notes, and I'm like, I gotta get this thing down to like 25, 20, maybe 30 pages at the very most if it's a real condensed class. So what I would do is I'd con condense and condense and condense and condense and get everything down to like, because you know, you can't go through 150 pages. It's just, just ridiculous amounts of, of material and work. So, right, 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 all day long with those SEC things. That sounds fun. But you condense them, you condense them, and you get down to that point where it's just, it's just, it's just the, the, it's what you need to know. And you get there. What I say is what you need to know is, is just get, get the 13 epistles down. I mean, just the stuff we read in Ephesians today, I mean, come on, that stuff's pretty basic. You can't get the 13 epistles down. Well, you know. <laughs> I've tried. Okay. You know what I mean. Oh, I Work on those mean. 13 epistles as, 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 a, as the summation of the rest of the yeah. 66, oh, okay? okay? Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Get, this, get the 13, work on those 13, and that will open you up to the rest of the 66. How, how many times do I go back to something in Psalms and in Isaiah yeah. and Ezekiel and Ecclesiastes and all kinds of Samuel, and I'm going through all these books, and I, it's crazy. You can go look through my Bible, and I go, I've never really, I mean, yeah, I've read Samuel at a point in time, but, I mean, I have half the book marked up from going back and reading stuff that I was looking at, right, from other stuff. And that's, that's the big, biggest, picture, picture, uh, biggest picture of understanding. So, again, finishing off this thing, Paul says, I therefore so, notice what the, the phrase is, I therefore so run, okay? So, when you're, when you're, Paul says, walk, not as other Gentiles in the vanity of their mind, well, also, what do you do? When time's running out, when you're trying to redeem the time because the days are evil, are you going, oh, let me just crawl over there? No, you're running. You're, you're hitting the ground and you're flying. Why? Because there's stuff you got to do. Like, like Frank right now, it's tax time, right? So what's that mean? You walking? No. You're running. You're, you're, just, you're, you're nonstop. It's marathon time, you know? And that's how you're looking at it. And what is that finish line? What is the goal you're looking for? That you may please him, right? That ultimately what Paul says, that you may approve the things that are what? Excellent. And that you may be what? Sincere and without offense. If he says it, obviously it's possible. See, it's not that God goes, oh, oh, mm, mm, mm. that one, grace didn't cover that one. That one's on you, right? It's not, it's not going to happen. When you get the judgment of Christ, you're not going to be like, oh, oh, that one, no grace there, no grace on that one. He's more looking for, dude, what a waste of time, right? And, and I want to make it clear that he's, the whole purpose of it is not for him to just go, wow, you know, you big waste of time. He says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, that he, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, 
that so shall every man have praise of God. That's a good, that's a good verse. Well, how can every man have praise of God? Yeah, well, it's, well it's obviously not, it's not in relation to the, the, the great white throne judgment because no. every man is not going to have a praise of God at the great white throne, no. you know? Not possible. But the judgment seat of Christ, every man will have praise of God, right? So reading and finishing his office is there, I therefore so run, not as, not uncertainly, right? That's just the same thing like, so you're not supposed to do it uncertainly, cer certainly, not, you're supposed to run circumspectly, right? Not as, fools but as wise and then he also goes and gives you the fight so fight I because it's hard to do that it ain't easy you ask anybody that's ever trained for a marathon if it was easy they're going to tell you no there's a lot of work and I had to run and I think the most I ever run was like 12 miles in one sitting I thought I was going to die can't imagine running another 12 <laughs> miles or whatever it is you know but again not so fight I not as one that beateth the air but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. What is that? That's temperance. Self-control. Lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. See, the castaway is when you have your, your ministry. I, I, I give you, I had a great example of it. When, when that guy tells my buddy and says, well, why would I do it? I mean, you, your life is a shambles. I mean, you, you do all these crazy things, too. You were just over at Mons Venus for that guy's bachelor party, and why, why, would I, why are you a Christian, right? Why should I even be that? You see how that works? You try to preach to that guy and try to tell him, and they're looking at you going like, you crazy? I'm not believing your nonsense. You, your life is a complete disaster, right? So when you don't bring this objection, the castaway aspect is not that God's, it's not that God goes, okay, throwing him out the window, Right? Can't reach anybody. It's like you got there's no you, your your benefit is in, in terms of ministry is very small because you didn't exercise any discipline. Right? Look, if you want to be if you want to strive for masteries, you gotta do so in a specific way. And uh, next week I wanna go through just briefly look at uh, you can just read these verses. You know what? I won't even I won't even go through them next week because I don't wanna I don't wanna spend another week on this. Uh, just next week or just look at Ephesians chapter four. And that he has given individuals to go through uh, to for the perfecting of the saints, right? For the work of the ministry. And he wants the body to come to a unity of the faith. See, the body has a lot of action. So can you imagine if, if you know, one guy gives him the gospel? And then he's got three other friends who are living, living like the gospel. And, and people are like, what does that mean? What's living like? Well, you know what I mean? Living not in the flesh. Living by the spirit. Exercising the fruits of the spirit. And, and, and actually having that live out in their life. And that's all of a sudden making a bigger, bigger, bigger impact. You don't think people look at how you live and go, I, I, I remember the very first time I was in an office, and I'll probably say it was one of the hardest grievings of the Holy Spirit I had in a long time. I was in an office, and we we're working on something, and the receptionist was there, and the office manager was there, and we're talking. And we were finishing a job, and I was like, I was getting super frustrated. Like, stuff was not going right. This, this, the fiber cut wasn't happening. The guy was, the, the, the provider was late. All these crazy things. And I'm just like, this is, this is ridiculous. Why is this taking so long? And the, the girl was kind of whatever, and the partner was yelling at me. And I'm just like, and I basically just rattled off some curse words. I was like, you know, blah, 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 after this, blah, blah, blah. You know? Right. And I was, I was frustrated. And I remember the receptionist go, go, girl going, you just cursed. And I went, what? She goes, I've never heard you curse. And I thought to myself, <laughs> Rebuke. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Oops. And I was like, ouch, that hurt. And I was like, you know, and it's funny is I probably have, I'm sure, said something at one point in time, but I do watch my tongue. And I try to. And I go, huh. Oops. But that's funny to see somebody who's an unbeliever call you to the mat on the situation. And I thought to myself, I go, and I looked at her and I go, well, why do you say that? She goes, because I thought you were a good Christian boy. <laughs> I'm like, ooh, ouch, right in the feels, you know? So, you know, people do look at you. They do watch what, you, watch what you're saying. Like she doesn't curse, maybe? Oh, no, she does. Okay. And I, I, threw, I did, no, I did, I did go back to her. my sin into believing that Christianity is a religion of works. Sure. And you're not yeah. working. Right. Because that's what they use to judge you. Oh, I said, I know I told her, I think I mentioned something. I said, well, the grace of God covers me, so I'm good. And I said, I shouldn't do that, and I know not to do that. Well, so if I'm a Christian, I can do whatever I want. Well, well, you do. So. You, exactly. you, you do, exactly. and you can, well, and it will be bad for you. On audio video, he said, I didn't learn to cuss until I got cable. <laughs> Funny. I'm thinking, me too. <laughs> 
<laughs> I had two older brothers, but you know, that, that is true. That moderation has been there a long time. Mm-hmm. And the cable comes along. And oh, yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's just, it just becomes part of your, just part of your language. Right, right. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I agree. That's why I don't have cable in my house. Nobody believes me, but I don't. I promise you. No cable. It's not that I, I don't have any time to watch it either. I watch like one, I, I told you, I watch like one movie stop every me. six months. <laughs> not that it won't really stop me. <laughs> really? I gotta, I, I, you know, yeah, well, you know, they call it cursing like a sailor for a reason. You yeah, know? Right. I get out on the boat and I start I losing fish. I sure. <laughs> <laughs> got some serious problems there. I know some lawyers. Oh yeah, this is, this is also true. All right, well, let's close with prayer. Dear God, again, we thank you.